jubilees are coming, coming in the by and by. Gonna go fly, gonna go fly, flying up to the sky. When I see my Jesus, when I see my Jesus, coming down after me. Gonna go to meet him, gonna go to meet him, what a glad jubilee. Well, jubilees are coming, it's coming in the morning, what a happy time it's gonna be. Gonna be. Better be a praying, better get yourself a ready if you want to see the Jubilee. Everybody's gonna be shouting and singing, everybody's gonna be free. Everybody's gonna be happy at the Jubilee. Gonna be shouting and singing at the Jubilee. Gonna wear a crown, gonna wear it in the morning, wear it in glory land. Gonna play a harp, gonna play it in the morning, everything's gonna be so grand. Voices by the millions will be singing when they join them, join the happy song of victory. Gonna be shouting and singing at the Jubilee. Some of these mornings, some of these mornings, gonna put on my crown. Into that city, into that city, just gonna walk around. Gonna be a shouting, gonna be a shouting, gonna shout victory. In that city, in that city, gonna be a jubilee. Well, the jubilee's coming, it's coming in the morning. What a happy time it's gonna be. Gonna be. Better be a praying, better get yourself a ready if you wanna see the jubilee. Everybody's gonna be shouting and singing. Everybody's gonna be free. Everybody's gonna be happy at the jubilee. Everybody's gonna be happy at the jubilee. Gonna wear a crown, gonna wear it in the morning. Wear it in glory land. Gonna play a harp, gonna play it in the morning. Everything's gonna be so grand. Voices by the millions will be singing when they join them. Join the happy song of victory. Gonna be shouting and singing at the jubilee. Gonna be shouting and singing at the jubilee. That I'm anxiously waiting For this flight that is leaving soon I make plans and I'm taking a journey Why don't you come and go while there's still room Now I've already made my reservation On this flight that is leaving soon Well, I don't know when I'm going but I'm ready, it may be midnight or morning or noon. Well, I know that I'm anxiously waiting for this flight that is leaving soon. I'll be going when I hear that last trumpet. With the bride awaiting for the groom And the time is at hand for my departure On this flight that is leaving soon Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready It may be midnight or morning or noon All I know is I'm anxiously waiting for this flight that is leaving soon Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready It may be midnight or morning or noon All I know is I'm anxious to wait in For this flight that is leaving soon For this flight that is leaving soon Top of the Tuesday morning to you on this Tuesday morning, the 19th day of March, 2024. We're grateful you're with us today as we continue, continue our study in the book of Daniel. And we're going to be getting into Revelation this morning, our overarching study. <clears throat> and it's good to see everybody. I saw everybody 
worshiping and getting ready to leave soon this morning. It makes me feel good to see all those airplanes. That means we're all getting ready to go and leave very soon, ain't we? And uh, we're grateful that you're here this morning. I really am. You know, I uh, <clears throat> I heard a, somebody say something one time, and, and I mean it, 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 I, it. I feel the same way. There's a lot of things in life that I guess as you get older, you don't take for granted. And uh, you just don't. And um, I can tell you this, this morning, you that are here with us, we've never taken you for granted and we never will. We're, we're grateful. We are truly grateful. Every time we see people show up to listen to the network, we're happy. Um, I know we're not the biggest network out there and um, we've never really sought to be the biggest network. Um, that's why the shows are conditioned and um, done the way they're done. That's why we do Bible studies. Uh, this is never going to attract a large crowd. Um, and there's a lot of false teaching. There's a lot of things that are out there that do attract a large crowd. But um, we've never cared about that. I mean, I, I, I've just been grateful the Lord's blessed the show as he has. Uh, we've come into some contacts with some great people like James Akers last night. What a great show we had with him on the News Network. We want to welcome in our News Network folks this morning. Chat's down. If you want to come chat with us, you got to come over to the Faith Network. But um, we're grateful you're here this morning. Every now and then, we're going to do these Bible studies over there, too. Um, we don't do them on Facebook. I, uh, I want to make it clear we don't air the Bible studies on Facebook. i got reasons for that. Um, but we do air them on the Faith Network. Every and um, we, um, we've been doing this. We started this in September of 22. It's hard to believe it's been that long. But we've been going a year and a half. And uh, it seems like we just started these yesterday. It really did. And uh, over a year and a half, if you're thinking about five, four, three or four shows a week, 52, I mean, we're, we're approaching nearly 250 Bible studies that we've done um, here on the network. And we're grateful for those of you that have been with us. I've watched the crowds increase sort of gradually over time. We've got uh, an average crowd of so forth. I, I look at the views afterwards. I know a lot of people tell me we can't really get to you in the morning because of work and all, and that's fine. And we understand that. I mean, there's some that can't. There's just some folks that can't see us live, but they do watch them. And we encourage you to share out these studies and also the network and subscribe. If you've not subscribed, pass it to your friends. Uh, like the video. It helps us keep our algorithm up on YouTube. I'm not good about all that stuff. Um, I'm looking for somebody that is, but um, we're still looking. Um, but um, please uh, share these studies out. We hope you're getting a lot out of it. MacFilesForum at gmail.com if you um, have any questions. I want to go back to a question we talked about yesterday with Mark Rare. I'm not going to spend long on it because we got an outline to look at this morning. Um, he mentioned how God, the the... Uh, wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah had come up before him and he went down it says to see um, and I answered half that question I didn't answer the other half um, and it really speaks it's, it's an important question and Mark I hope you're out there this morning he's a good man him and Susan are precious to us they're up in Indiana um, and um, it's a great question it really is because it has to do with America in many ways uh, and empires, these empires of the past, um, whenever an empire or a nation or cities or any, any place on this earth gets so wicked, um, the, I've, I've read behind, um, I'm not sure who it was, John Walford or one of these commentators that I've always looked to and respected, um, I want to just say this about these older commentators. Uh, these older commentators know God. I don't have a lot of faith in these new theologians. I do not have a lot of faith in these new new faces that are on the on the horizon and all these fascinated YouTubers that are catching the YouTube by storm. I don't have a lot of faith in them at all about their their biblical truth that they've got. And um, I. I'm not saying that as a slight, and I'm not saying that we know everything here. We've always told you here, folks, whatever we tell you, you need to check it out with the Bible. And if the Bible, um, if, if we're not saying something that's right, um, you, you've got a right to 
throw it out and reject it. Uh, there are sometimes we say things, we don't say it, the, we, the, it's the way we phrase it sometimes that people take it and run with it and trash the network because they don't have something up here between their ears and they're not listening and they just want to trash the network and that's fine too. But um, we never have taught anything that's outside of the Word of God. We read the Bible. That's what we do here on these Bible studies. But these older commentators knew God, and they knew the spirit of prophecy. They understood the basic mountain peaks of prophecy. They understood Israel's role in these last days. And he was talking about Israel, and he was talking about... He, Sodom and Gomorrah came up in this discussion that he was writing about, and he mentioned this very thing, Mark, that you asked about, about the, the wickedness coming up in the nostrils of God, because he likened, in the book of Jeremiah, he literally, and in Isaiah too, he likened Israel and her sins of the old covenant. When Israel got so wicked before God, he likened her to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he made the comment, he said that whenever a nation reaches a point that it gets so wicked, he said. There's there's this there's this crisis point where the wickedness on that nation literally starts seeping up into the heavens, and God sits on His throne. God sits on His throne. Jesus is at the right hand of God, Father, seated at the right hand of God. So it gives you this idea, and I like what James Aker says every time he's on the show. God's in control, and. That place of control is God's not running all over heaven and witnessing. He sees everything. God knows everything. God hears everything. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's everywhere. He's the Holy Spirit. Um, but he doesn't react to everything, not right away. But when a nation becomes wicked and so wicked, like Sodom and Gomorrah did and ultimately Israel of old did, um, look, folks, Israel was delving into the very things that Sodom and Gomorrah was doing, and they were Israel was doing it against light. It was different because Sodom and Gomorrah had no Bible. The great late Leonard Ravenhill wrote a book called Sodom Had No Bible. And um, the, um, the issue there, the, the only light that Sodom had was light. And Lot wasn't very good light. Lot was in a state he shouldn't have been down there to begin with, but <clears throat> out of rebellion to his uncle, he took his goods and services, and he went down to Sodom, and he sat at the gate. And it it got so wicked down there that uh, the, the scent and the aroma, literally, of what was going on in Sodom. And we're adults in this room this morning. This is an adult Bible study. We're not kids. You know exactly what the sin of Sodom was. It was sodomy. That's where we get the word sodomy from. And it was men having sex with men, probably lesbianism, but it was more than that. There was an abundance of pride. There was an abundance of idleness, laziness, basically, where the, the society had gotten so lazy that the government, I mean, it was corrupt. Um, Ezekiel talks about this. It was an abundance of idleness, pride, abundance of bread, waste, uh, but that sin of homosexuality, that sin of sodomy, is what got so perverse, and there's no telling. There's even hints in some historians' accounts, maybe that uh, the Bible sort of hints that it was worse than even that, that it was bestiality. I mean, there was sex with beast. And look, folks, sin never stays stagnant. Once it starts rolling down a hill, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse unless it's repented of. And when it explodes and it literally starts seeping up into the heavens, that is when God has to move. It is very likely when it says the sin of Sodom has come up before me, what it means is, and we talked about the angels, the angels were how God went down to see <clears throat> how evil it had become. And when they got there, the men of Sodom literally tried to have sex with those angels. And they go into Lot's house. They knew Lot. They were going to get Lot out. That was what they were there for because of Abraham's intercession. They were going to get him out. But when they got down there, they saw, and it was literally the eyes of God, seeing the wickedness that 
Sodom had delved into this bestiality, homosexuality, sodomy, men with men, women with women, um, and this scent and this aroma had come up to God and he finally had to do something. And I will tell you this, one of the things that Walford said, and I totally agree with this, Josephus, in sort of the great historian, um, sort of hinted at it. And other commentators through the years and decades have hinted at it that had God not destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, that that sin of that day, at least of Abraham's day, would have enveloped the whole earth and it would have destroyed the whole earth. It was already in place even then, what's going on today. Now I want you to fast forward this statement. So what happened, let me go back to Mark's question, when that aroma got up so bad and the stench of it got so bad in the nostrils of God, he had to move. He had to move. He gave Abraham, that's why he went to Abraham. He went to Abraham when that happened and he said, should I hide from Abraham this thing that I'm going to do? And he told Abraham what he was going to do and that's when Abraham stood before the Lord and he started interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, Lord, please, please, if we can just find 15, 10, 20 souls and it went from 20 to 15 to 10 to 5. And the Bible says Abraham left the Lord talking. And God finally, when he said, when Lot is out, I can't destroy that city until your nephew's out. And when the angels went down there, the men of Sodom literally tried to have sex with those angels. And they had to strike them blind. They got in the house, and they warned Lot. They said, if you don't let us have those angels, we're coming in after you and your daughters. We're going to do to you some things that just ain't good. And the angels literally reached out their hand and struck those men blind. And they told Lot, they said, get out immediately. Don't look back. And that was their instruction. That was God's instruction. Do not look back. Whatever you do, get out in the plains do not look back. And the sad footnote of this is that Lot's son-in-laws, the daughters were married, they would not come. They mocked him. They mocked Lot and they said, we're not going with you. Um, there's mockery today and there's scoffers today and the, the peril of the mockers and the peril of the scoffers and the peril of those that make fun of this is going to be the same. It's going to be the same. Fools make a mock at sin. They mock it. They mock it. And um, Sodom and Gomorrah stands as testimony of both God extending mercy to his people because Lot was his people. It didn't matter how backslidden Lot was, folks. And there's a Bible lesson in that. Look, God is married to the backslider. He cares for you, you may be away from God this morning, but if you know Jesus and you're born again and there's things in your life that don't need to be, it's just a simple act of kneeling down and stopping and saying, Lord, forgive me for my sins. I'm I'm a sinner and I need to repent of this. And it's folks that, that that's how quick you can be cleansed and forgiven. And I can be cleansed and forgiven. So despite Lot's spiritual condition, it wasn't good, he was still God's child. And he told Abraham, he said, I cannot do what I'm going to do until he's out. And those angels come and they tell Lot and his family, get out. Don't look back. And he was only able to get his wife and his two daughters out. His son-in-laws would not come and the rest of the family would not come. He could not get nothing but four people out. Noah at least got eight on the ark. Lot couldn't get but four out of Sodom. And there's a Bible lesson in that and I don't want to get into that this morning. Your family's the hardest one to reach. Families are the hardest to reach <laughs> when it comes to these things. And there's reasons for that, I'm sure, but I won't go there this morning. But I will say this. The, it was a miracle, to be frank with you, that he even got the wife and the daughters out because Sodom had gotten into them. And the way we know that is when they got out in those plains, the wife turned around as God was bringing that fire down from heaven and destroying Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone, literally. Two cities in the plains. And by the way, uh, archaeologists have looked and looked and looked and looked for millennial, not centuries or decades, but for millennial, trying to find remains of those cities. They can't find them. There's been a few hints 
in archaeological finds through the years that they think they have found some remains, but when God does something, he don't do it. He don't do it halfway. Um, and he's complete in what he does. He's just in what he does. But Walford's statement was, had God not done that at the time, it may have destroyed civilization of that day. I want you to bring this into today. And you think about where we're at as a nation. Think about where we're at as America, the American empire. You can call us an empire. You can call us a nation, republic, whatever you want to call us. Um, we are allowing things, folks, that third world nations don't allow. We are literally allowing things that nations with no civilization, no civilized practices would not allow. Um, you know, and I... And I, I'm even scared to say this because it, it, it just, even saying it out in the air, I just, I cringe at the thought. But a lot of these third world African, these nations steeped in voodooism, occultism, child sacrifice, witchcraft in the jungles of Africa. And you could even say Haiti. James talked about Haiti last night and these Dominican Republic uh, <clears throat> islands down there in the islands of the Caribbean. In the backwoods, there's so much uh, cannibalism, child sacrifice, literally sacrificing children to heathen gods. Um, but about the only thing that, that you're not seeing in full-blown whatever in America right now is cannibalism, but you're seeing different stories come from time to time of people eating people's organs. I mean, folks, there's some gross stuff. I mean, I don't go looking for it. I have to check the headlines every day for our news network because we try to keep our telegram room populated and we have to look for things to talk about. And every now and then I'll come across a story that some individual possessed by demons, you know, is found to have disembodied members. And you see the, the grotesqueness of the crimes that we're hearing about and people being chopped up, mutilated and things like that, and we wonder, well, where, where does that come from? Why did, have we de delved into that darkness? And I go back to the homosexuality thing in America, and this is not a, a rant about homosexuality this morning. It's more about the nation, a nation that is full of light, supposedly, allowing things, allowing things, and promoting things, not just allowing it, but promoting it. Um that third world countries that don't know the gospel hardly do. They do some. They, they certainly, I'm sure it's prevalent. But we're not a third world country. We are America. We are America the beautiful. We're, we're the country that God shed his grace on. If you don't think, and I don't think this morning, that our iniquity is not coming up before him right now, I, I truly believe it, folks. I believe that our iniquity is coming up before the Lord's nostrils just like Sodom's is because we're getting, it's getting pretty dark in this country. I mentioned it yesterday. One of the names on that beast that John saw in Revelation 13 was blasphemy. Blasphemy. And that word blasphemy means anything that is against the course of God, godliness, anything that seeks to rebel and be in rebellion against God. It's, it has roots in pride. It has roots in arrogance. It has roots in false doctrine. It has its roots in false religion. It has its roots in any kind of demonic activity that exists outside the realm of light. And on that beast crown, he had ten crowns, and the names of blasphemy were on each crown which means that on each of these empires of the past, those things were prevalent in all of these nations. Blasphemy was part of these empires of the past, the present, and this future beast empire is going to be full of blasphemy. It is very likely uh, that we're going to read this in Daniel 8. There's, there's a lot of question about whether he's a homosexual. Um... Uh, and then the other question gets into where is he a Jew or a Muslim. We're going to talk about that Saturday night. I'm going to encourage you to be with us in Waveland, Mississippi over the weekend. That's going to be our Saturday night discussion. We're going to be talking about the things we're talking about with you this morning in detail. 
Um, you know, Chris can go all, get all through this in an hour, which you probably won't be able to. But um, the, these are the things that we need to really seriously chew on. And again, I'm not. This is not a, 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 a cringe and a judgment thing on the situation with the homosexuals this morning and those that are involved in that. I'm, I'm speaking more about our nation. I'm speaking more about the iniquity because that's not the only sin that is got God's attention, folks. There's a lot of other things that we're doing as a country that's got his attention. And it's all filtering in to this cauldron of hell, this cauldron of toxicity, and it's like a witch's brew. And it's, it's like this scent of evil, this scent of debauchery, this scent of perversion, this scent of corruption, this scent of putridness. And that's what we're doing. We're putrefying from within. Rome putrefied from within. Greece putrefied from within. Medo-Persia putrefied from within. Babylon putrefied from within. And all empires of the past that have destroyed themselves, Egypt, Assyria, all of them, usually putrefied from within. Communism destroyed itself, ultimately, because it became so corrupt that it ceased <clears throat> basically the people that they <clears throat> controlled they were not allowed to do anything and communism imploded upon itself <clears throat> and god took it down because of the slavery there's no empire that's ever been built on slavery that's why what abraham lincoln did in this country was righteous before god he stopped an evil that had come up before the lord and i firmly believe abraham lincoln had god's anointing on him and god's ordained mantle to do what he did in stopping this evil in our nation. God does not want men to be slaves. He wants men to be free. And granted, when man's free, sometimes man don't make the right choices. And man chooses other things than God, and that's sad. But it, God wants man to be able to do what man wants to do. And that's God's ordained pattern. He doesn't want man to be... Look, even when it comes to choosing God, God does not want man to choose God because he feels like he has to. He wants man to choose God because he wants to. Now, ultimately, we do have to choose God or we're going to die and perish. And we need to choose Christ because that is our path to eternal life. But God wants that to be a free choice. That's why he put two trees in the garden. That's why he didn't make Adam and Eve robots. That's why he didn't even make the angels robots. He gave the angels free will. They had free will. Those third of that third of that angelic host that took its, its lot and threw it in with Satan, they had free choice to do it. They got judged for it, but they had choice. Lucifer had a choice. God made Lucifer a fallen angel. He, let me change that. Not a fallen angel, but an angel. He made him a cherubim, an anointed cherubim that covered. We went through this in detail here back at the end of 23, and we spent weeks, maybe months, on that anointed cherub that covereth of his origin. And he had free will. America has free will this morning. And these things that are happening in our nation, folks, and it's not, again, not just one thing, it's, it's a cauldron of it. It's very similar. It's very similar to Sodom and Gomorrah. It really is in many ways. But the difference, again, the difference, and I say this a lot, and it scares me. It, it, it chills me when I say it because I know if you read the Bible and you see what happened to Israel and you see what happened to these nations, folks, it was, it was their judgment a lot of times was measured by the amount of light that they had been given. And I, I, fear, I fear for this nation. We're not doing this in the dark. What, what these things we're doing, folks, we're not doing them in the dark. We're, we're not doing them as, as a kindergartner not knowing right and wrong. No, this country has been blessed with so much biblical knowledge and so much ability to know what's right and know what's wrong that it beggars description. There's not a probably a home in this country, even the heathen homes, that have not been exposed to some kind of Bible message and some kind of faith to give them a choice to say, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. There's a lot of people that have Bibles in their homes they don't even open. And Bibles just sit 
on tables. They never open them. They're just there for decorative purposes. Churches have become that way. And because the country is putrefying from within, we've lost our salt. We've lost our light. And Jesus said it in Matthew 5. He said, if the salt loses its Savior, what good is it other than to be thrown underfoot and cast into the fire and thrown into the dunghill? And I'm going to be frank with you this morning, folks. America's sin has stunk. Our stench has become just like a dunghill. It goes back to the same stench that came up, that came up before God's nostrils. And see, that's how God, that's when God, that's how God moves in nations' affairs. When that stench gets so bad that it comes up to the heavens, you got a problem. And I got a problem. The nation has got a problem. Sodom and Gomorrah had a problem because what they were doing had gotten so sinisterly bad that it reached heaven. I've asked this question this morning. I'll, I'll ask it, and I'm going to get on to the lesson after this. How far up in the heavens do you think this nation's sin and stench has gotten? I can't answer that question because I don't know. But I will tell you this. What we're doing is very evil right now. What we're doing as a country, willingly, against light, against the knowledge of God, against every blessing that he could bless a country with, against great prosperity, against the freedom. That's the other thing that scares me. We're doing this as a free country. It's not like that we have communist guns stuck to our head. It's not like we, we can't worship God. It ain't like we can't go to church on Sunday. It's not like we can't read the Bible. It's we don't read the Bible. It ain't like we can't go to church. We don't want to go to church. It ain't like we can't worship Jesus. We don't want to worship Jesus. It ain't like we can't worship the Creator and acknowledge God as the source of all freedom. We don't want to acknowledge God. There's a big difference. There are nations, and I didn't see Ricky out there this morning. I'm sure she is, but Ricky has been interceding, and she's got a group of intercessors from China. And those people would die, folks. They would die for the opportunity that we have here in America to listen to the gospel. It ain't that we can't. We can. There are nations out there that can't. But in spite of all of this light, and in spite of this, that evilness, that wickedness, the putrefying smell and the stench of the dunghill, it's coming up. It's coming up into the heavens and it's something to think about but Mark that was a great question and I'm glad you asked it and as I slept on it last night I said I answered half of it but I wanted to go back and answer the other half because the reason God went down there to begin with <laughs> was that their sin had reached up to his nostrils that sin of Sodom reached up and John Walford made a great point he said where is America standing in light of this, and Billy Graham, the, the great evangelist that's passed on a few years ago, God bless his heart, he had a tremendous ministry. I didn't agree with everything theologically. He preached a simple gospel. He didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he preached a simple gospel. That was really the only thing me and him didn't see eye to eye on. We had a good, I think he was pretty square on his doctrinal stuff for the most part, I, what I could hear through the years. But he cared about souls. I will tell you this, Billy Graham cared about souls. And that's why I respected him immensely, and still do. But he said one time, famously, he said, if God doesn't judge America, he will have to come back and apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And I will tell you this, my friends, this morning. On this 19th day of March, God is not one that apologizes to mortal sinful man. He is not one that has to apologize. But, but that's what Paul said in Hebrews when he says, or in, uh, I think it was Numbers 2, when uh, Balaam was trying to curse Israel and God wouldn't let him because he said, God is not a man that he should lie nor repent. God is not a man like we are. God is a spirit. There ain't going to be no apologizing to us at the judgment. That's why this psychological bull something that claims that we have to forgive God. <laughs> Excuse me for laughing. Let me say something. We're the speck of dust. 
We're but a speck of dust. We're but a speck of dust made in His image. But never forget that He is the Creator and we are the created. And the creature needs to worship the Creator. And man worships God, not the other way around. And God does not apologize to man because everything God does this morning is just. What he did in Sodom and Gomorrah was just. What he's done to Israel in her past for her rebellion and sin was just. When he judges, he judges fairly. When he moves, he does everything right. Whatever God does, we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God. Why does it work together for the good? Because when God does something and allows things in our life, you can be sure, you can be sure it is for your good and my good and His glory. And in this narrative, this prophetic narrative that we've been talking about Israel, even in this tribulation that she is about to go through, I talked to an old classmate yesterday and we were talking about this and he, he said, I, you know, it's, it's hard to fathom that the Jews are going to come back. Israel's going to come back to God, but God is going to allow them to go through this seven-year hell to get them back, and he will. But it is just and fair in light of what she needs because God knows all. God knows all. And he is firmly fair and firmly just. You may not understand everything that God does, and I don't understand everything that he does and allows sometimes. And folks, that's just the course of life. And, you know, Elira Stentfield wrote that song in the sweet by and by. We'll understand it in the by and by. And, and folks, one day we'll understand a lot of this. Understand, we'll probably, we'll sit down and, and he'll tell us exactly why things happen in our life. I'm sure that he will. I'm sure. We'll understand it one day. But right now we can't. Paul said we see through a glass darkly. And excuse me for getting off on this this morning. We see through a glass darkly, but we walk by faith. But we can rest assured that whatever is happening in our lives this morning and whatever is happening in our nation, at least for the remnant, for the remnant's sake, for the remnant's sake, Lot was the remnant in Sodom, and God was willing to go get that remnant out. And he's going to get this remnant out of this Sodom too. Because the trump of God is getting ready to sound, neighbor. Trump of God is getting ready to sound. <laughs> I felt it yesterday and I feel it this morning. The trump of God is getting ready to sound. And Lot is getting ready to get out of Sodom. Moses brought Israel out of the Passover that night with the blood, the blood of the lamb. And in South Dakota, one of the lessons we're going to have is the Passover and the rapture because it's Passover weekend. And the Passover when he's told Israel to have your feet shod, ready to go at any minute, <clears throat> because at any minute we're leaving Egypt. Let me tell you something. At any second, neighbor, at any second, <laughs> glory to God. <laughs> Man, I felt the Holy Spirit on this last few days. At any second, at any second, at any second, at any second, we're getting ready to get out of Egypt. We're leaving Egypt. We're leaving Sodom. We're not going to be here. The trump of God is getting ready to carry us out of here. Because God's not ordained the church to stay in Sodom. He's ordained Lot to get out, and he's ordained us to get out. And he's going to bring us out. But for the remnant's sake, for the remnant's sake right now, he's staying his hand of many things, but whatever he chooses to do with this country, folks, will be fair and it will be just. We need to understand that this morning. We all need to understand that. And whatever he does in our personal lives, folks, he is always fair and he's always just. 
And to these godless shrinks and these godless counselors and these godless demonically inspired psychiatrists that get out there and try to tell people, man, you just need to forgive God. Let me tell you something. That is the most blasphemous thing you can tell an individual. There is no forgiving God. God doesn't need to be forgiven. No, we need to repent of our sins and repent of ourselves and repent of who we are, not just of what we do. When I made that statement and everybody got in a tizzy about the sin's not an issue, let me tell you why sin technically is not an issue, because we like to repent of things, but we don't repent of who we are. We don't want to repent of what we are and who we are. Because that is what really repentance is. It's not just repenting of what you do and don't do. And me and you and, and all these lists. We got this list of sins that we feel like we need to repent of. No, God wants us to repent of who we are as a nation. And who we are as a nation is nothing but spiritual Sodom. And it is spiritual Gomorrah. Just like he called Israel of old spiritual Sodom and spiritual Gomorrah. And if we would repent and acknowledge that first, let me tell you something, God would bring revival to this country in a second. He would release the floodgates of His glory over this country and you'd see miraculous things take place. But the church doesn't want to repent of who it is either because the church is so self-righteous and the church is so bitter and the church is so wanting to be rich and wanting to influence this world and, and get involved in the world's affairs and get involved. They totally reject prophecy. They totally reject Israel's role. They reject these things. They don't care. They don't care about the future because they want the present. We want the present. We want to live now and build these future kingdoms and build our kingdoms now. These kingdoms, folks, are going to fall. Now, I've wasted a lot of time this morning, but I think it's a good waste. I really didn't waste time. It was the Holy Spirit. Mark, good question. Our sin, our sin, who we are as a nation is coming up. It's coming up in the nostrils of God, folks. It's, 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 it's moving up in the nostrils of God. And it really goes back to our Bible lesson yesterday. Blasphemy. Blasphemy was on those horns and on those crowns. Let's look at our Bible verse of the day. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Let's go to Revelation 13 and 1 again. I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up, out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads, 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 nations, empires, the name of blasphemy. Let me come back over here. Technically, what I've been teaching is part of our lesson this morning. Every empire of the past, folks, and those of the future are going to have blasphemy upon them. They have been full of blasphemy against God. Which tells us that there's no goodness in this world system. There's no good in this world system. There's no good in this world system. There's no good in this world system. The kingdoms of all the empires of the past, the, the empires of the present... And even the two that are yet future, the seventh and the eighth kingdom to come, the revised Roman Empire that will delve into the revised Grecian Empire. Listen to me. Blasphemy, 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 blasphemy is their lot and is their title and their name. John saw this on their head. They saw this on their head. He saw this on their head. Now, let me go to Revelation 13 and 2. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet was like a bear. His mouth was the mouth of the lion. And the dragon gave him power, seat, and great authority. Now we talk about this a little bit, and I'm gonna I've got about 15 minutes, and I'll sorry for the 
little sidetrack today. It was a good sidetrack. You thank Mark Rear for that. Don't blame Mark Rear for that. You don't have to blame him, but thank him for that. It's good. It was a good question, and I'm glad he asked it because it it speaks to where we're at today. It really does, folks. It 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 it, it, it speaks to where we're at in this kaleidoscope of history and this kaleidoscope of prophecy that is because America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy. And there's reasons for that. Um, all right, now, I've got an outline I want to show you this morning. That leopard, and I'll get my whiteboard out here. As you know, this is the image of Nebuchadnezzar that he saw in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 7, God gave him a vision of four beasts, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and an undescript beast, okay? This is not the same beast as Revelation. But it's interesting that John said he, this beast was something like I could not describe. Remember this, all of these visions were seen in the spirit realm. In the spirit realm. Babylon was like a lion. Medial Persia was seen as a bear. Greece was seen as a leopard. So, when you see this Bible verse in Revelation 13 and 2 that this beast was like a leopard, that is a key to us that this is going to be the eighth kingdom, the eighth kingdom, the eighth kingdom. You've got five kingdoms here. You've got the feet down here. The legs are iron. That's wrong. But there are two kingdoms prior to this, which were Egypt and Assyria. That's seven. And the eighth kingdom is going to be the beast. There's going to be an eighth kingdom that is going to be a revision of this kingdom right here, which is revised Greece. Which is revised Greece. Let me see if I can get a lighter shade up there. That'll sort of help us see that. Um, yeah, that's better. Greece, right here. Right here. That is Greece. Now, when John sees this beast, and you say, well, what does that mean, beast? That's what we're going to talk about for the next few days, and I want you to follow me. By the way, let me come back over here and say this. At spiritjournals.org, we've got this outline that I'm about to share with you this morning already uploaded in a Word document. It's called The Eighth Kingdom. And we're going to be on this, and if you've not went there and downloaded it, I would encourage you to. It's sort of like a syllabus and so forth. Um, when we start writing our next book, once we get this other book finished, uh, we're going to write a book on Daniel, but we're going to do it as a study guide. It's going to be a Daniel and a Revelation study guide, a prophecy study guide. We may do it in three volumes. And um, it'll have questions and appendices and charts and maps. So we're working on a, a big project coming up this year. Uh, Chris has just got to finish. He's got to finish this other book first about departing from the faith. I'm, I'm working on it. It's It's been a challenge. I, the devil has really fought a lot. This There's something with this book. The first book on the Holy Spirit was easy to write for some reason. This second one's been tough. And it's just been a lot of resistance and a lot of um, stuff that has happened. And I, I'm trying to fight the, the lethargy. And it's, it's lethargy, but it's just this block. I get these mental blocks, and I'm, I'm stopped in some places. And it's just, it's just I've got to shake free of that. But uh, we're going to get it done. It's, just, it's actually done. We're just tweaking it right now. But um, after that, we're going to deal with this subject in our next several books that we're going to be doing over the next couple of years. So if you go to spiritjournals.org, you can download this outline. But I want you to look at this with me this morning because this is sort of what we're going to be talking about, about this beast. The beast and the dragon are two different things. He saw a dragon in Revelation 12 and 3. The dragon had the same thing, seven heads, ten horns. But the beast had blasphemy on his heads. And that's what I want to talk about this morning because there's a difference. And the beast is going to be the power over the Antichrist, but he's also the Antichrist himself. And he's also a kingdom. And I want you to write this down this morning. <clears throat> 
We have the eighth kingdom. We have the eighth kingdom, which is the Antichrist and the beast that will help him. The Antichrist himself is a man, even though he's called the beast. The beast is a fallen angel, a principality. Alexander the Great's conquest and his empire will mirror <clears throat> and does mirror the coming empire of the Antichrist. You could almost reword that opposite. The Antichrist will mirror the conquest and the empire of Alexander the Great, who is the notable horn, who is the notable horn between the eyes, between the natural beyond the natural ability of a normal man. We've talked about this, and I'll just mention it again. Alexander the Great was aided and abetted by a fallen angel, a principality. Um, I, I'm not sure what we're going to be doing. we got Easter and Purim coming up, and as of right now, we'll still be on Spiritual Warfare Sunday, but whenever we get back to the Spiritual Warfare series in April, our next message is going to be the walls of the devil, and we're literally going to look at Ephesians 6, and those principalities, spiritual wickedness, what those things are, and what we're up against. And I want you to remember this with me this morning. It's very important. Um, a fallen angel cannot inhabit a person. A demon spirit can. A fallen angel, Satan cannot come into the Antichrist. There's, there is a theory out there. There's several theories we're going to look at about this man of sin in this study. And one of the theories is he's a reincarnation of Judas Iscariot. And the reason that Bible people claim that is because it talks about this eighth kingdom going into perdition in Revelation 17, which we will look at that in detail in this next few weeks and months. And Judas is called the son of perdition by Christ. Let me just say this and clear that little fallacy up. Uh, reincarnation is not taught in the Bible. It's demonic. That is part of the Eastern Hindu religion. It is part of these New Age, I'm reincarnated. You remember Shirley MacLaine out on a limb, that kind of thing, that she claimed she was somebody else in a previous life. Folks, I saw from the demonic realm of the New Age and occult and witchcraft. And you hear anybody insinuating and hinting at that, they are full of the devil. <clears throat> they are. They're literally full of demon spirits. I don't care how religious it sounds. I don't care what religious network they're on. They're full of the devil. I don't care how it's made to be mon ma mainstream and it's, it's said that there's good certain things in Wiccan and there's good certain things in witchcraft. No, there's no good things in Wiccan and there's no good things in witchcraft. It's the same devil, it's the same demon, and it's all evil. It's all evil. Period. Period. But reincarnation is one of the tentacles of this religion. And they believe that in some mystical other life, you were somebody, and then now you're living today as a reincarnated form. That's one of the theories about the Antichrist. That people believe that he will be a reincarnation of Judas. That is false. He will not be. The dragon is going to give him, however, his power and his kingdom and his authority. I just read that verse to you. If you look at that verse closely, he's going to give him his power, he gives us a seat and great authority. So Satan is going to give him those things, but Satan cannot inhabit him per se. When the Bible says Satan entered into Judas, what th that really says in the Gospels was that the devil fully, the demon spirits in Judas were so in control of him that Satan's emissaries had controlled him so much that it was probably literally like Satan's kingdom was fully into him. He, he did enter him through his spirits. When Satan enters somebody, Satan cannot inhabit a person because Satan is a fallen angel. And a fallen angel cannot inhabit an individual. A demon spirit can. And when he says he's going to give this beast, this creature, this antichrist figure, this man, all of his seat, all of his power, all of his authority, it's speaking that he's going to give him all his, 
his arsenal of demon powers that is known to the devil and known to the kingdom of darkness. He will have any power of darkness at his disposal. That is what it means. He's not going to be reincarnated. Um, the son of perdition comment, again, has been, again, misappropriated, misinterpreted, because people don't read their Bibles and they don't understand, and I don't mean this critically, I'm just saying that's, that's why I'm doing these Bible studies, folks. Now, I want to make it clear as I close this morning, you don't have to agree and believe a word Chris McDonald is saying. This is our Mac file faith Bible study in the morning. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want to know. But even those of you that are here, you've got to, you have more than freedom and right to chew on what I tell you. You don't have to believe it. You can believe what you want to believe. That's why I told, told you yesterday, there's some people that are hell-bent on believing that Christians can be demon-possessed and there's nothing I'm going to do to argue with them no more. I'm not arguing with people. I'm just not going to argue with them. If they want to believe that, let them believe it. If people want to believe that Judas is going to be reincarnated as the Antichrist or the Antichrist is going to be reincarnated as Judas, ain't nothing I can do to stop it. And I'm not going to fight about it. I can tell you, though, that a fallen angel cannot inhabit a person. <laughs> and the Bible, nowhere in the scriptures, speak of reincarnation, and neither does it speak of an assassination where the Antichrist dies and comes back to life. Folks, the only time that resurrection has taken place in Scripture, there's been really three of them, Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, and the widow's son. But let me tell you about all those resurrections. All those three individuals died again. They died again. And if the Bible was going to state that the Antichrist would be resurrected from the dead, it would have said he will be killed and raised from the dead. That's what the Bible would have told us. It does not tell us that. It tells us that one of his heads, one of his heads, plural, is going to be wounded. I can tell you the Antichrist is not going to be a freak of nature and have seven heads on his body. No, those seven heads are speaking of empires. And one of the heads that have been wounded, meaning, meaning broken off, of the past, which Daniel tells us in Daniel 8. If you'll let me go back and show you this. In Daniel 8, what did it say about uh, of, um, of uh, <clears throat> Alexander the Great? Um, it says it right here. <clears throat> when he was strong, the great horn was broken. The notable horn was broken. Alexander the Great was head of the Grecian Empire. He was the head of Greece. And when Greece, when he was broken, his empire literally split into four things. There was an element of Greece that was left. It was Turkey, Syria, and Egypt. And that is, it was no longer the Grecian empire. It became split. So when it says one of the heads are wounded, what it's saying is that this fifth part of this vision, the belly and thighs, the leopard, Greece, that has went away in the past, is going to be resurrected in the sense of it will come back and become the eighth kingdom. The Grecian Empire is the eighth kingdom. I'm going to give you a little verse this morning. I'm going to give you a little spoiler. I've got to wrap this up today. I meddled too much this morning. Um, I want you to look at this verse with me in Zechariah 9 and 13. I want you to look at this very interesting verse right here. Zechariah 9 and 13. When I had bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion. I want you to look at this. Against thy sons, O Greece and made thee as a sword of a mighty man. Let me tell you what that's speaking of there. That's speaking of the great battle of Armageddon. He is speaking of Christ coming to the rescue of the sons of Jacob and the sons of Ephraim. Because Jesus is a son of Jacob, 
He's from the line of the tribe of Judah. But do you notice the reference who he's fighting against? He's fighting against the sons of Greece, the Grecian Empire. I'm going to show you another verse to chew on. We're going to talk about this more tomorrow. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from thy border. That is speaking of the Antichrist, folks. He is literally talking to the Antichrist in Joel 3. He's speaking spiritually. You've taken my silver and my gold, have carried your temples, my goodly, pleasant things. Yea, and what have you do to me, O Tyre and Sidon? He's speaking of the great battle of Armageddon. You say, how do I know that? Because in Joel 3 and 1, it says, I'm going to bring again the captivity, and I'm going to gather the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Guess what Jehoshaphat is? Jehoshaphat is Armageddon. God's never done that in the past. That is a, an event yet future. But in the reference of Joel 3, he tells the Antichrist, you've sold my people into the hands of the Grecians. He's going to have a Grecian empire, which is the eighth kingdom. Let me read one other quick thing to you. Mike, write this down. The beast is symbolized as three things. And we're going to look at these points. In Revelation 12 and 13 and 17, the beast is a supernatural angel, a fallen angel. He's a mortal man, and he's a kingdom, and it's a kingdom. And we're going to look at all three, and we're going to show you how each one plays into Bible prophecy, and he is literally the beast out of the abyss. He is a beast out of the abyss. That's why we named the subject matter the beast out of the abyss. Did you get something out of this this morning? Did you get something out of this this morning? Put some fire in that house this morning. Good to see all the folks out there. Outdoor, Gloria, Cindy Max, Susan Prusky, good to see you. Susan Barrett, Karen Barrett, I should say. Sorry about that, Karen. Jimmy Lemons, good to see you, buddy. Barry Duff, Delisa, Donna, Joe, Jill, Suzanne. Uh, Mark Rary, good to see you, buddy. Glad you're in the house today. And uh, let's see here. That's all we see on the chat. I know there's others out there. Patty Isaacs, good to see you. Um, Lisa Esco, good to see you this morning. Uh, Carol Smith, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Now, listen, we're grateful for you today. I'll see you tonight. We're going to be dealing with, uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do tonight. I'll be here. If the worst case scenario, we'll just do a wrap-up show on the uh, News Network tonight, but we want to welcome you News Network folks in this morning. How many of you are out there? And we had a good crowd here in the Faith Network. Uh, spiritjournals.org, spiritjournals.org. Go to your uh, website there, and you can download that outline that we're, we're about to get into, and you'll have it sort of in front of you, and that way you can sort of be looking over it and getting ready for it. We're going to get back into this tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> And this slide is leaving soon. Don't forget, folks, please help us in your giving if you can. We've got a lot of projects coming up. And uh, any donations that you can give us will be so helpful right now. Um, we truly do. And Zelle, Chris Mac 44 at gmail.com is the way you can donate. P.O. Box 50942, Knoxville 37950 is our address. <clears throat> and your donations help keep these Bible studies going. Been going for a year and a half. And we thank you for helping us. We thank you for helping us do these. And we hope you're getting a lot out of them. I sure am. I've been enjoying this. I've been enjoying this teaching. I've, I'll be frank with you. I've, I've done this a few times in the past um, with churches. But I've really enjoyed this more than I've ever enjoyed teaching it with you. And I, I mean that. And I uh, hope you're getting something out of this. And we're going to uh, streamline this a little better as we can as we go forward. Um, Chris ain't the most organized person in the world. <laughs> So we're doing the best we can. But we hope you're getting something out of this, okay? And I'll see you tonight on the regular Mac Files News Network, and I'll see you back here in the morning on the Bible Study, Spirit and Word Bible Study Hour. We love you today. Be looking up. Jesus is coming. And this fly, this fly, this fly, this fly is a leaving soon. Now, door, open that door. <laughs> Tell them Long Islanders, listen up. <laughs> I just love outdoor events because I, I can see her doing it too. May the Lord bless you. I'll see you tonight. Be blessed. Well, 
I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready. It may be midnight or morning or noon. Well, I know that I'm anxiously waiting for this flight that is leaving soon. I make plans and I'm taking a journey. Why don't you come and go while there's still room? Now I've already made my reservation on this flight that is leaving soon. Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready. It may be midnight or morning or noon. Well, I know that I'm anxiously waiting for this flight that is leaving soon. I'll be going when I hear that last trumpet With the bride awaiting for the groom And the time is at hand for my departure On this flight that is leaving soon Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready It may be midnight or morning or noon All I know is I'm anxiously waiting for this flight that is leaving soon. Well, I don't know when I'm going, but I'm ready. It may be midnight or morning or noon. All I know is I'm anxiously waiting for this flight that is leaving soon. For this flight that is leaving soon. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its stories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, the design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, health to the soul, and a river of pleasure. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Pray it in, read it through, live it out, and pass it on. <laughs>